near mint condition, the home of collected oh, edition. That cover is so awesome. Absolute format is the best way to own this store. Time to empty those wallets and fill those shelves. What in the world could X-Men The Hidden Years be? And when does it take place in the reading order of X-Men? Well, this is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition, the home of collected editions. And I hope to answer those questions for you as we take an advanced look at your very first omnibus in 2024. So, join me. And welcome back, everybody. What we're looking at here is the X-Men Hidden Years Omnibus from Marvel Comics. This book is due out in the direct market and book market on January 2nd of 2024 or January 3rd of 2024. And it's crazy to already be talking about books next year. But hey, by the time you're watching this video, it's like right around the corner. Uh, what we're looking at here is the direct market cover supplied by John Byrne. On the left-hand side is your standard edition cover, also supplied by John Byrne. So yes, this is the complete series by none other than John Byrne. And of course, the direct market cover will only be available at your local comic book store, places online like CheapGraphicNovels.com, WaltzComicShop.com, ComicsBugle.com, Organic Price Books, Dying Breed Collectors, In Stock Trades, Tales of Wonder, Read Comics, BDCosmos.com and places like that. Now, everything underneath the dust jacket is the same. So let's take a closer look at this particular cover, which is really interesting because you don't really see the X-Men in here dressed with those particular outfits. What they have here are their graduating outfits. Uh, but here you have the classic X-Men. You have Angel, you have Cyclops, you have Marvel Girl, The Beast, Iceman, and back here, Straining is Professor X. Now let's take a closer look at the spine. Marvel Omnibus, X-Men, The Hidden Years, John Byrne, Tom Palmer, and then Cyclops down there. And the missing chapter of X-Men history. It's one hell of a back cover. ISBN down here and retailing for $100. Rated T. Now, before I take the dust jacket off, I'm sure... I'm being questioned where I'm going to put this if, if I were to do a reading order of X-Men. Well, I'll show you where I'm going to put it. Technically, this is a retcon that shoehorns a lot of stories in between issues. Yes, I realize I just said it's a retcon, but I do have the X-Men classic omnibus between Uncanny 2 and 3. So this really belongs after the X-Men Volume 2 and right before Uncanny X-Men Volume 1. That's where I'm putting it. But again, you can put it wherever you want to. You can start another shelf. You could put it with the miniseries or the one-offs, wherever you want. But I think if you want a reading order where these stories really belong, this is where it is. Now, what in the world could that possibly mean? Well, we'll get to that here in a second. Let's take it out the dust jacket here. And unknown exploits of the strangest teens of all. A little bit about what this is. And then the bio on the creators, including Tom Palmer, who we lost last year. He's one of the most amazing inkers. So we have this piece right here by John Byrne and Tom Palmer. Uh, you have, again, the spine this time around with the standard edition uh, picture down there. And then some frames from inside the book. Featured the artwork of John Byrne. All right. It's going to be weird, but just in case, minor spoilers, even talking about the pitch of this, in case you don't want to know what this is and you just love everything X-Men, whether it's X-Men Adventures, the comics that are based on the cartoon, or whether it's classic X-Men, you just, it's X-Men, so you buy it and you, you don't need to watch it. You just go and jump to the build of the book. Uh, but for anybody else, I'm going to be talking about just minor things and what exactly this is and why I'm putting it right after the X-Men Omnibus Volume 2. All right, let's go ahead and crack this omnibus open. Here's your end sheets. And you have the title page here, X-Men to Hidden Years. And the credit page, X-Men to Hidden Years. X-Men created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. And here are the credits of the particular book that you're going to be reading. And most of it, like 95% of it, written and 
penciled and lettered by John Byrne. Uh, you do have Gregory Wright doing the colors, but more importantly, Tom Palmer with Joe Sinat doing one, uh, actually two issues in here. And then you have the Fantastic Four and Amazing Adult Fantasy, which is very important uh, for a particular storyline that starts off towards the end of this run. Okay, so collected in here is the X-Men, The Hidden Years 1 through 22, Fantastic Four, the 1961 series, the original Fantastic Four, 102 to 104, and then material from X-Men, the 1991 series, the adjectiveless X-Men, as some of us like to call it, issue 94, and Amazing Adult Fantasy number 14, which became Amazing Fantasy number 15, which of course introduces us to Spider-Man. 640 pages, and what the hell is this book about? All right, let's talk about this book. The Hidden Years was John Byrne coming back to the X-Men. It was such a big deal. Like, it wasn't like he had left the X-Men completely when he left in the early 80s, right after issue 143. He did come back from time to time, whether it was with Wolverine or whether it was scripting some of the adjectiveless X-Men stories or uncanny X-Men stories um, or drawing some pictures here and there, like issue 273. But this was a big deal because this was him just having free reign over a particular era of X-Men. All the stories that you're going to be reading through here take place in between issue 66 and Uncanny X-Men 94. So just a brief little history in case you have never heard. And if you have, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, I'm sure. Uh, but just for anybody that doesn't know, X-Men wasn't the best-selling title in the 70s. As a matter of fact, it got canceled as of issue number 66. So issue 67 through 93 became nothing but reprints. And the X-Men did show up and so did their villains throughout issues of Avengers or the Fantastic Four or e even the Beast went through some changes. So what John Byrne wanted to do was go back to that time, start off with, let's say, issue 67, what could have been right after the aftermath of issue 66 and tell stories in between uncanny x-men i know it wasn't called that but i'm just keeping it plain and simple 66 and uncanny x-men 94 which really is telling stories between issue 66 and giant size x-men number one which introduced us to the new team of wolverine storm colossus nightcrawler sunfire uh, just to name a few of those team members that joined in giant size so we're back to simpler times and holy crap did he do his homework there's a lot of things when i was rereading this that i had forgotten i was like did that really take place at the same time and i'll talk a little bit about that so that's what this is and he's joined by tom palmer who of course inked some of neil adams stuff uh back in the day when he neil adams and roy thomas were working on the x-men and oh my gosh there are some amazing pictures here that really really just channeled that neil adams and you know even back then we always talked about how john byrne was a lot like neil adams so not, we didn't call him a clone we didn't have a, that word back then uh but there were a lot of similarities in their artwork and uh you're gonna see a lot so what kicks it off here is this little backup story from x-men 94 again it is the adjectiveless x-men that introduces you to the concept of this particular series. We see Professor Xavier, after faking his own death, because there was an oncoming invasion, kind of take over the role of the headmaster of the school and put his students in their place. So they get attacked by the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, led by Magneto and Juggernaut, and Cyclops is like, wait a minute, these guys have never worked together. Gene, what's going on? And it's all just a test from Professor Xavier. And then we get to the real issue, issue number one. This is the brand new adventure with Marvel's premier mutant team. And this is a really cool introduction. Before Onslaught, before Apocalypse, before Phoenix, and the tragedy of Dark Phoenix, before a man called Beast came to more closely resemble his name, or a high-flying angel became a razor-winged tool of the enemy, there was a dream, and a man in his dream, and his students. And that's what this is. Uh, so we do see them battling the Hulk right here. And again, kind of like catching you up to speed as to what happened in the previous issues. And the biggest question I'm sure I'm going to get is, do you need to have read issues 1 through 66 of X-Men? Or for that matter, since this is a retcon, do you need to have read 
anything past giant size one if you're just familiar with x-men i think you'll be able to enjoy this uh like i said much more simpler times it does spoil a couple of things that are to come if you haven't read the chris claremont era just because uh without going into spoilers john Byrne just loves the shoehorn things in and kind of foreshadow the things to come uh, so yes, this is all taking place during that particular issue of... I'll do you one better. If you go back to your X-Men Omnibus Volume 2, you'll see the same scenes drawn from a different angle. And you'll see a little bit of change in dialogue. So what the story recaps is issue number 66. And what the X-Men are trying to do is find uh, this particular piece of machinery that Professor X gave Bruce Banner. And it would restore him back to life in case he put himself in a comatose stage to battle the forces that are to come. So now we look at immediately after he wakes up and he was like, oh, my students, I missed you. You know, if you haven't read issues 1 through 66, this will spoil some things as to like who really died. And if not Professor X, who was it that died? Now, what happens in the aftermath is makes perfect sense. Bobby Drake, Iceman, just refuses to stay at the mansion because he can't trust the man anymore. He he doesn't want to be around Professor X. He was like, he lied to us. We thought he was dead, and now he's alive, and he's already bossing us around. And he does. He starts bossing everybody around. This is a nice homage to, of course, X-Men number one, the To Me, My X-Men uh, image by Jack Kirby. So Professor Xavier calls the remaining mutants into his study hall. Cyclops, Marvel Girl, Angel, Beast, Havoc, and Lorna Dane right here. And what he does is he enters their minds to kind of play catch up from the moment that he went into this coma until he woke up. So he learns, you know, why they thought he was dead. He learns about the battle with Grotesque. He learns about Miss Marrow and the appearance of Lorna Dane and then Alex Summers, uh, the Sentinels. And he was so proud of Cyclops uh, for tricking them. And like, like I said, a lot of cool stories that you may not have read might be spoiled here uh, through these pages. So keep that in mind. Uh, but it's a quick recap for those people that don't want to go back and read Silver Age stories. And he finds out what ends up happening uh, to Alex and the living monolith and Sauron and, of course, Magneto. Now, it is very important to note that Magneto during this time is believed to be dead. But, I mean, it's comics, right? I think I can say that at any decade. It is important to note that Magneto is believed to be dead in any freaking decade of X-Men. And what Professor X does is he snaps. He's like, wait a minute. You didn't check for a body? Cyclops, get your butt out there with the rest of the team and go and make sure Magneto's dead. So he sends him to the Savage Land. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Professor X, day one, wakes up and he's already bossing people around, reminding Cyclops how much of a leader he sucks at being. Uh, Bobby Drake, again, not sure what to do with himself, stays around the mansion and he feels really jealous about this relationship that's building between Lorna and Alex. And he kind of snaps at them. And that will lead into a long storyline wow this artwork i mean look at that that is beautiful and it does remind me a lot of neil adams there's a lot of neil adams in here i mean you take away the modern color that they were using during this time and there's nothing wrong with gregory wright's colors actually i think it fits uh this particular artwork here and i know i think you know I want to play it safe and say some people will find the issue with this particular color because it is those early stages of computer generated colors or the help of computer generated colors. Um, I'm not sure if you all remember, was it Joe Mad and the Liquid team? Like it kind of reminds me of Liquid Colors, especially that cover right here to, yeah, those colors right there. It's like they were experimenting and trying out new things, but then it starts looking like this. And Palmer just knocking it out of the park in each and every panel. Absolutely stunning. Helping John Byrne's art just come to life. When I first heard about this project, I wasn't reading comics at the time. I heard about it when I came back to comics and I was excited. I'm like, oh, John Byrne is writing and drawing comics? Please, for the love of God and everything that's holy, tell me Terry Austin's a zinker. And I found out it was Tom Palmer and I was like, okay, well, Tom Palmer could work. And you're probably noticing how long some of this dialogue is because it is written in that old school style but modernizing it some 
And to kind of summarize what happens through here, we have a long story arc that features the Savage Land, the possible ghost of Magneto, the possible return of Magneto, and we have another storyline that involves Iceman, Havoc, and Lorna Dane. Now the mutates are involved through here, and if you're wondering if anybody shows up, you know, because John Byrne had the advantage of knowing what's to come. Hell, he helped co-write a lot of those stories in Uncanny X-Men. So he knows what's to come. And yes, he does throw a couple of characters in here. And I want you all to be surprised as to who shows up through here. Whether it's a young version of themselves or whether it's a alternate version of whomever I'm talking about. But one of my favorite parts that I loved about this series was how much he uses the supporting cast. I'm talking about the old school supporting cast like Vera and Candy Southern. Like characters that if you read the Silver Age, they disappeared for a long time. It wasn't until the pages of X Factor with uh, Louis Simonson writing the stories that they started showing back up. And unfortunately, they showed back up just to... I, well, never mind. That's a little bit of a spoiler for X Factor. So... Uh, forget I said that. It's just nice to see them use these characters. Kazar shows up through here because, of course, uh, we are talking about the Savage Land. We have the Neil Adams design Magneto costume. I love that costume. Never gets used anymore. And look at that. Speaking of Neil Adams, there's so many pages I can just look at and think, is that Neil Adams or is that John Byrne? Let's uh, actually skip a couple of pages through here because I wanted to talk about these issues. These are so brilliantly done. Oh my gosh. So what John Byrne did was, okay, we're going to put the X-Men up against the Fantastic Four in this particular issue. What I'm going to do is have Tom Palmer ink my X-Men and Joe Sinat, Jack Kirby's old inker, ink the Fantastic Four. So their art styles are so different, even though it's the same penciler, that it kind of looks like, I mean, obviously he's channeling Jack Kirby through these images, but it's so interesting to see it like right beside a Tom Palmer ink. I thought that was so awesome. Like what a freaking amazing way to, you know, throw it back to that old school feel, but also have that modern twist to it. So if you're wondering what happened to Bobby and Alex and Lorna, well, they're hanging out in the Savage Land and Bobby ends up getting amnesia and then we have the return of Sauron. We also have the return of the Sentinels. And we have this character right here, Kruger, that is pretty much just recruiting a bunch of freaks. He doesn't like to call them mutants. He's like, let's just call them what they are. We are a bunch of freaks. We have the return of the Brotherhood. Magneto has this amazing fight with Sauron. And the last thing I'm going to say before I talk about the type of story or the way that this is done is that... Okay, it's a cool throwback to the classic, not the classic, but the second Jean Grey costume. And she gave Courtney her Marvel Girl costume. What we have is a couple of things that happen through here. Number one is the return of this character known as the Dazzler. Uh, that had a big role to play in Warren Worthington's life, in Angel's life. And we also see something important happen through here. Like, I wasn't expecting this to happen. Uh, where... In, character ends up dying and it's canon to this day it's canon and i always wondered wait a minute did that work is, is that right and i went back and reread a bunch not this time around of course uh but when i was reading these for the first time i actually went back and read a bunch of issues and i was like oh my god that retcon actually works i don't know how the hell john byrne did it but he did it nice now there's something else that happens through here and it's the last story arc uh i want to talk about and that is the return of a character named Tad Carter. And Tad Carter was the very first mutant. Tad Carter is the character that appeared in Amazing Adult Fantasy number 14. He's the mutant that's hearing uh, voices in his head. That at the time, you know, when we were kids, or when, I'm sorry, when I was a kid, we all were like, oh, that's Professor X. And he recruited Tad Carter, and they went on adventures, and Tad Carter died. It's the dark history of Professor X. Of course, later on, they did something very similar to in that with uh what was it ed brubaker's uh deadly genesis what 
<laughs> Byrne did was remember that story, brought back not just the character of Tad Carter, but also introduced us to the concept of who was talking to him. Who was the character that Tad was talking to throughout that issue? And that's where the promise comes in. And that is such a cool concept. Like I was, when I was coming back to comics and I read that, I'm like, oh, please, please tell me that they've kept all this, that all this is canon. Uh, so the for the very first time, these characters, the promise appear through here. Uh, we see the main, their leader recruiting them and a bunch of other mutants, much like Professor X, went on to recruit the X-Men. And even though it's a retcon, I thought that retcon, even through this reread, still works. And I think that's all I will say about it. There's a couple of other surprises, but let's get to the end here. So X-Men The Hidden Years, the final three issues, take place in between issues of the Fantastic Four 102 to 104, and it works like magic. So they reprint the issues of the Fantastic Four here, which is the big team up between Namor the Submariner and Magneto. And what's also, like I mentioned, reprinted in here is this particular story that introduces us to, like I mentioned, Tad Carter and the voice that's talking to him and leading him to the promise. Now, before I look at the extras, I wanted to come back here just a little bit uh, to talk about what to expect. If you've not read this stuff, don't expect Neil Adams, Roy Thomas type of stories through here. Don't expect John Byrne, Chris Claremont type of stories either. I feel like if, if people read this expecting, oh my gosh, it's John Byrne. It's the guy that gave us the Dark Phoenix Saga, Days of Future Past, uh, the Proteus Saga. I feel like you're going to be let down because it's so different. It's kind of an amalgam of both the Roy Thomas, Neil Adams era and the Chris Claremont and John Byrne era. Keep in mind, John Byrne was a storyteller. He, you know created Alpha Flight, the very first issue, he reminds you, oh yeah, that's right. The X-Men are a big part of another universe, or, or are a huge part of this bigger universe because we have the Hulk, we have the Fantastic Four to show up through here. We have other cameos that happen through these pages. Um, but it, it's dialogue heavy and it's got narration boxes, but it's not, it, it doesn't take that long to read. And 22 issues isn't a lot. So what happened? Well, he gets to wrap up a lot of his loose ends, but not all of them. What ended up happening was Joe Quesada became editor-in-chief and decided to cut the X titles because there were too many. So from 1999 to 2001, John Burr worked on this book and wanted to go on, well, as he said, for 100 issues. But with Burr, uh, Quesada coming into the book, he canceled this title. And unfortunately, the series ended with issue 22. And yes, it could have gone on longer. I don't know, about 100 issues. Uh, but, you know, about 12 more. Another year to wrap up a lot of these stories. Because uh, one of the things that Byrne also did was started to separate the X-Men. Because even though they're a group, he ended up separating the team from, like, the first issue. And you'll see through here the teams are separated for a while. And they do come together from time to time. All right, that's enough talk about the stories and the type of storytelling that you're going to find through here. Let's look at the extras and welcome people back in case they didn't want any spoilers. And these are the textless covers. And no, there's nothing wrong with your television set. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's nothing wrong with your TV screen. How do I put it? Uh, there's nothing wrong with your phone. I'm just censoring a couple of covers because I want people to be genuinely surprised as to appearances of some characters that I didn't talk about. And then the back here... We have some original artwork with John Byrne and Tom Palmer inks. Skipping a couple of pages that spoil things. And some more Byrne. Man, a couple of these just look like Neil Adams pieces of artwork. And then your end sheets. Now let's take a look at the binding and talk about the build. 640 pages. Not much of an eye, but it is there. We've seen bigger. We've also seen smaller. But how does it lay over? Well, we do have spread pages through here. So you are going to find some gutter loss through here, mainly because of the binding. Uh, this book is printed at the iMac printer. So I wanted to come back to this page right here, which is a perfect example of the type of bleed through that you're going to have. So you do see some, not a lot. Honestly, the paper stock they're using for this feels a little 
thicker than what they've normally used, uh, just because I'm so used to iMac books or um, mega print books. So not as much bleed through as I thought there would be. Uh, don't get me wrong, there is some, but not as much as we've seen in the past. And I did show what the spread pages look like towards the beginning, which you do get minor gutter loss. Like you can't even see Hank's face there. There we go. Wanted to come to the middle to show what the spread pages look like. But honestly, there's not that many spread pages. There's more splash pages than anything. But that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing this omnibus, don't forget to check out our sponsors. If you're in Europe and you're interested in buying these books, definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices, flat shipping rate of 12 euros for all EU countries, emails answered within 24 hours, waltzcomicshop.com, and you can use the code near mint condition at checkout and get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order over 40 euros. That's Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. Ding! CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with a kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this book. Let me know in the comments down below if you plan on picking it up, if you have fond memories of this particular era, if you even knew what this era was, if you were confused as to what the hidden years were, and you thought it was something else, like completely different, and if I was able to answer some of your questions. If you have any more questions, please leave them down below. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.